Welcome to Skyscraper 101, a truly comprehensive course in mega construction. Class objective, construct a giant building in downtown Los Angeles. Watch the real men of steel. Connectors, hook-on men, and bolter-uppers fashion 13,000 tons of steel into the skeleton of a building. Here's what two years of blood, sweat, and swearing can do. Now, building a skyscraper, the skeleton, on Modern Marvel. Designers use every tool in their box. The image is always the architect that is drafting board, which is kind of an old uh, image. Um, it's all computer now. In the computer, we can do a, uh, a model and rotate the model around, see it from any angle that you want to see it from. Render it or shade it um, so that you can see kind of the surfaces, uh, more like you would see a traditional model. And it doesn't have to stay in the computer. Take rock. A builder might have to drive piles, pounding long pieces of concrete or steel down to bedrock. Piles won't be necessary for the Caltrans building. But before concrete pouring for the footings can begin, builders have to dig the hole. It's the pit on top of which the building will sit. To get the digging done, the excavation subcontractor uses specialized tools. Giant excavators. Red footings are basically a rectangular or square concrete block. In this case, about 18 feet by 18 feet by 4 foot deep. That support the structural steel column. Even at the excavation stage, this project takes an enormous amount of planning and coordination. After the excavation company has removed 200,000 cubic yards of dirt, the concrete subcontractor comes in next. This project will take 36,000 cubic yards of concrete for the foundation and floors. There's a few different ways to place concrete. One is you tailgate it out. Of Although cement mortar dates back to at least the Romans, modern concrete construction wasn't possible before the invention of Portland cement in 1824 by Joseph Aspden of England. He burned and ground together a mixture of limestone and clay, creating modern hydraulic cement. It hardens with water and gets stronger with time. By 1900, engineers were using concrete to construct bridges, streets, and buildings. To make concrete stronger, builders started embedding steel reinforcing bar or rebar into the concrete. Concrete performs well under compression, but not as well under tension. Steel, on the other hand, performs much better under tension. So the two together, the concrete and the reinforcing steel, will then resist both compression loads and tension loads. Builders use reinforced concrete in foundations, walls, floors, and sometimes structural columns. These guys make it look easy. What can you do with 13,000 tons of steel? Well, he could produce 17,000 SUV bodies, or 280 million soup cans, or our downtown L.A. behemoth. Now that the foundation's set, it's time to erect the skeleton. Large buildings are supported internally by a steel or reinforced concrete framework. And the first steel to go into a building is always a big event. There's a charge in the air as spectators watch the tower crane swing the first steel column into position. We have four separate gangs. But the first one we have is the uh, the raising gang. And they're responsible for erecting all the structural steel. 
And we have the bolt-up gang, which is responsible for bolting it all. Then the plumb-up gang comes by, and they're the ones that plumb it. And we have the welding gang, which, after all the bolting's done, they go ahead and weld it. By most accounts, the two connectors, who are part of the raising gang, have the most difficult and dangerous job on the site. The connectors are the ones responsible for joining all of the uh, steel together. Every stick of iron that you see here is put up by two individuals and a crane. The piece comes in, we're supposed to put two bolts in on each end, one's supposed to be wrenched tight, and then um, they come afterwards and put all the bolts in. Our job is just to get the iron up as fast as we can. You don't get to make a lot of mistakes in that part of it, so, you know. Working in a high-risk situation, a raising gang has to develop a strong sense of trust. It's this sense of camaraderie that holds this building together. That and about 89,000 bolts. We usually got a couple guys stuffing bolts behind the raising gang, and uh, another two guys tying up the bolts behind the plumb-up gang. Before the mid-1950s, builders used rivets to hold connections together. Pounded the rivet with a pneumatic hammer. While an experienced riveting gang could drive 500 rivets a day, in the mid-1950s, builders started using bolts, which were just as strong as rivets, but faster to install. They also required fewer laborers. Iron workers on this job bolt and weld the joints to create a rigid skeleton. And it was the invention of the internal steel skeleton like this that sent skyscrapers soaring more than 150 years ago. Three months into steel erection, one event rocks the job site, underscoring the hazards of the profession. A very unfortunate accident or Working in teams of four, iron workers riveted the 60,000-ton frame of the Empire State Building together in only 23 weeks. Building a skyscraper, the skeleton will return. Reek's job is to put together the internal steel skeleton designed by the structural engineer. The building is the top of it. While the architect gets most of the glory, it's the structural engineer whose behind-the-scenes work ensures a building can stand up, won't blow over in a typhoon, or fall down during an earthquake. The forces that act on a building, of course, is the vertical load, uh, which is from the load of the building, as well as the occupants in the building and the contents of the building. We call those gravity loads, because they're acting downward, vertically. Then we have the horizontal loads, which can be either wind loads or, or um, earthquake loads. The bigger the surface area of the building, the more wind load that building is going to be taking. If a building is too flexible, wind can cause large swaying motions. If a building is also light, the swaying can be relatively fast. The combination can make occupants seasick. Buildings with larger members, more rigid connections, or more braces, are stiffer and don't sway as much. Also, Buildings that are heavier sway more slowly, creating an easier ride for occupants. Stiff sounds great. You're worried about wind and tenant comfort in windy conditions. Stiff is not such a good thing when you're dealing with earthquake. In an earthquake, when the ground moves, the building is left behind, and then it catches up. The stiffer the building is, the more force it attracts. The structural engineer must therefore choose the best framing style for the building's specific location. There are a few telltale signs that Caltrans building is going up in the heart of earthquake country. Designers actually engineer structural weak points, called dog bones. Now those notches are there so that the engineer knows where the beam will buckle in an earthquake. So with the dog bone in there, the columns should not be damaged. So the building will be able to stand safely after an earthquake. But the beams may be damaged and may have to be repaired. But again, the building will be safe to, you know, for the occupants to exit. Beyond the seismic features, 
The framing of the Caltrans building is essentially the same as the first steel cage buildings. The Empire State Building was the high point, um, metaphorically and physically, of this kind of construction. Built in 1931 and the tallest skyscraper in the world until 1972, the Empire State Building was also a very heavy building. Iron workers erected 60,000 tons of structural steel. The limestone and granite cladding also added weight. The combination of weight and rigid connections made the building very stable, even in high winds. But in many ways, the iconic skyscrapers signaled the end of an era. The high rises built after World War II came to embrace the international style, which celebrated the austere beauty of metal and glass. Construction materials, including steel, became lighter and stronger. But structures built with lighter materials risked becoming too light and flexible. To stiffen structures, engineers started adding diagonal bracing around the internal vertical cores of buildings. If you were to take some popsicle sticks and just glue them together, if you put a lot of glue on those joints, obviously it's more rigid. And if you've then added some diagonal members to it, it, you can almost see the picture that it's even more rigid. So that's the way to resist the horizontal loads. A more radical approach introduced in the late 1960s was to move the bracing to the exterior of the building. The perimeter brace tube system most famously was used on the John Hancock Center in Chicago, Illinois. Everyone in Chicago can see these giant X's marching up the side of the building. Designed by the innovative engineer Fosler Kahn of Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, the John Hancock Center is a departure of sorts from traditional skyscrapers. Called tube construction, this design uses exterior diagonal braces connected to columns to resist some of the gravity load and absorb all of the wind load. Completed in 1969, the revolutionary design opened up valuable workspace because it required fewer support columns. The most famous tube design buildings were the twin towers of the World Trade Center. Closely spaced columns created an exoskeleton. Another building that uses the tube design is the Sears Tower in Chicago, which works like nine tubes bundled together. Engineers working with architects are always balancing how tall, how wide, how many columns, how big a window, how fat a column, how, how deep a beam. It all has to be balanced. There's no one magic answer. This building is about to be destroyed in what is called a controlled demolition. Buildings do not do this spontaneously. Here is another example of a controlled demolition. The initial charges are spaced about one second apart. And you can see that each section begins falling separately. Successful demolitions require that all structural support columns collapse at virtually the same time. If they don't, or if something else goes wrong, the result will look something like this. This is World Trade Center 7 just before it collapsed on September the 11th, 2001. It had not been hit by an aircraft. It had been damaged by falling debris and fire. But by 5.20 p.m. most of the fires had been extinguished. Although the building was 47 stories high, it doesn't fall sideways, nor collapse unevenly. For this to have happened, all of the building's vertical supports must have given way at almost exactly the same time. Yet the Federal Emergency Management Agency reported that the collapse was due primarily to fire. But what does it look like to you? As at July 2007, 
there is no final report on the collapse of World Trade Center 7, but the National Institute of Standards and Technology still rules out a controlled demolition. Yeah, here's one of the guys who can tell you I'm okay, all right? Here, hold on. You want to call, oh, yeah. call your mother or something? Another kind of cut commonly used in controlled demolitions is the so-called V-cut. This little V here it gives it a place to slide off. That's all it does. And by, by putting them on at this diagonal, we're trying to fill this structure in this direction. A large V-cut is visible on this chunk of structure from Building 7. The same chunk exhibits also a 45-degree angle diagonal cut on the cross beam with a lighter V-cut at the end of the other beam. Can you suggest a good reason why iron workers would need to perform V-cuts and a 45-degree cut on this piece of structure just to remove it from the rubble? on the left, a known controlled demolition, a series of them, on the right. Is there any similarity? Is there enough similarity to warrant an investigation into the possible use of explosives? Especially since it looks exactly like one. Especially since no high-rise has ever collapsed due to fire. Should this not have been the first, if not the only, hypothesis NIST should have been examining, and yet it was never treated seriously, only as an afterthought in the frequently asked questions, because so many questions came up to NIST regarding uh, the... on that forever. What we really need to know is how, how those buildings came down. World Trade Center 7 collapsed because of fires fueled by office furnishings. It did not collapse from explosives or from fuel oil fires. To undermine scientific integrity is to undermine our democracy. This is what NIST has done, denied and ignored crucial evidence. The American people absolutely need the truth of 9-11. More than 1,500 architects and engineers and 12,000 others, including many scientists, have signed the petition calling for a scientific investigation of the destruction of the Twin Towers and World Trade Center Building 7. The report, issued by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, referred to as NIST, was not valid science. They're talking about a single columnar collapse or failure that resulted in a total collapse of the building. Building number seven uh, descended in free fall for the first 100 feet, which uh, means that there was absolutely no resistance to the descent whatsoever. So all of the columns really needed to be severed at the same time. The symmetry is the smoking gun. NIST has admitted it went into free fall for eight stories. You don't need to be an engineer or an architect to see what happened to those buildings. <laughs> 